We are the unseen world of the Bible, session five, cosmic geography, which we'll have to define, 6th of November, 2022. Again, I have some objectives. You may object to them, but by the end, we'll be able to define or explain cosmic geography in biblical terms. Secondly, be able to describe how the gods got authority over nations. And then thirdly, we'll be able to explain what made Israel unique amongst the nations and why it remains unique throughout biblical history. The theme of today's lesson, God wanted a relationship with all humanity, but the rebellion at Babel changed that. Not God's desire, but the relationship. God decided to let members of his divine council govern the other nations, that is, other than Israel. Going back a bit, let's talk about God's original plan. Plan A. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Do you know of any entity in the world today that is trying to make that not happen? That's Planned Parenthood. That's one. Environmentalists. Some environmentalists, yes, there are. Uh, the World Economic Forum is very clear. One of their stated objectives is to reduce the population by 80 or more percent. But the Lord said, fill the earth. He wants a maximal number to come into his kingdom, into his family. So what went wrong? People died. People died. And in Adam, we all die. Reason for which we need a solution to death, which Jesus provided when he conquered death. But historically, something went very wrong with the plan. And that was the infestation of the human race by some entities the Bible calls the sons of God or the Hebrew equally you can translate it the sons of the gods class of beings generated a new race of beings that scripture called the Nephilim or the giant were also called Nephilim were the Goliath who may have been six and a half to seven feet tall depending on whether you follow the Hebrew text or the Greek text plan A however has been frustrated I will walk, wipe away from the face of the earth the human race I have created, for I regret that I have made them. And he did so, except for a small number of which we're aware. Even the New Testament admits that, well, about eight human beings survived. So, God comes up with plan B. Of course, he knew the plan well in advance. Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. Where have we heard that before? Genesis 1. That was plan A. Yeah. But plan A also included and rule the earth. In plan B, it's still fill the earth again, but there's no mention of ruling over it. Well, this time, what went wrong? The human beings had another idea. Plan B is frustrated. And here's a key text for much of the Bible. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Or what was the goal of their uh, plan? Not to scatter. They built a city and this tower that reaches to the heavens. Now, if you grew up in Sunday school, you probably got the idea that they built the, the highest tower possible in order to get up to the sky. Why would they want to do that? It wasn't their idea was to bring God to them. Now, it's a Western concept that the sky is way up there someplace. It's an Eastern concept that the sky starts at ground level. So we walk on the ground, but we walk through the shamayim, the, the, the skies. <laughs> and there are both visible and invisible creatures. The visible ones are in contact with the earth, and the invisible ones are in the atmosphere around us. This tower then was intended to make contact with beings who are in the atmosphere. But why a tower? Well, first, it wasn't nearly as tall as the Empire State Building, maybe uh, 60 feet or so, but it had another purpose, and it was this. In the account about Eden, we were introduced to the fact that Eden's geography had was both a garden and a mountain. 
And we also knew that the evil one's this intention was to go up onto the mountain and become like the Most High. And so the tower becomes an artificial mountain. The idea then is that perhaps the, the god or the gods will come meet us if we will prepare a very nice mountain for them. It's not the, the high skies we're talking about here. It's the invisibly inhabited heavens. This would also make a name for ourselves. We'll get a reputation with whom? Since they're the only humans, with whom are they seeking a reputation? The gods. The gods, exactly. We want them to pay attention to us. After the scattering, they did not stop building towers, but they did stop building the one at Babel. Many archaeologists feel they've actually found the base on which that original tower was built, being one of the oldest sites ever discovered in the Mesopotamian Valley. Uh, here's a quote right out of Wikipedia, that great... And the propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> the Sumerians, which is one of the oldest civilizations known from history, believe it that the gods lived in the temple at the top of the ziggurats. A society offered them many things, such as music, fruit from their harvest, creating devotional statues for them to get the gods to come live at the top of the mountain. And this is very credible to those of you who've ever lived in a country that practices idolatry. That you have to make nice idols or nice little spirit houses and decorate them, take care of them, clean them often, talk to them, ring bells, and the spirits of the gods will come inhabit the idol. And there you can present your petitions or your little gifts and offerings. Furthermore, many of the ziggurats of antiquity exist to this day, and they've been found on every continent, or nearly so. So Jennifer brought you uh, some samples. She has a book over here on antiquity with a number of photographs of ziggurats from different countries. God came down with his divine council, and he was discussing with them what they were going to do. And one of the things that they decided was that if they could confuse the language, folk could no longer communicate, and therefore they would separate. That was a very effective strategy. Science turns that around and says it's the separation that leads to a diversity of language. It's probably a two-way situation. What was the result then, according to scripture? We have what's called the Table of Nations, given to us in Genesis chapter 10. And there are exactly how many listed? 70 or 72, depending on how you divide the names. Reason for which, when you come over to the Gospels and Jesus sends out the 70, other Bible translations say 72. Did somebody make a mistake along the way? No. Some Jews were following the 70 list, others were following the 72 list, and they made corrections in their, their Greek manuscripts accordingly. So let us go down and confuse their language. So it's a fascinating study of what we call proto-Semitic language, which some say was probably what was spoken. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped at building the city, and started building other cities. So far, that's the story we're all familiar with. The author of Genesis, as far as we know, was also the author of Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, looking back, that author gave us further insight into the expansion of the human race and how the gods were put in charge of these various nations around the world. So we come to <coughs> chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. When the Most High gave, their, gave the nations their inheritance, yes. when he divided all mankind, right. he set up boundaries right. for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Now the term inheritance is generally used in the scripture of the land where you dwell. Because your inheritance, Eastern civilizations, was the family farm and the house and the buildings on it. So the inheritance has to do with, partly with geography. 
but it was the Lord himself who caused the human race to be divided into people groups. He set boundaries on the peoples, not necessarily on the land. The land boundaries, they change over time, sometimes very quickly. There's a land, you know, a boundary change going on in between Russia and Ukraine right now. According to the number of the sons of Israel. Now, if you, if you have the, the new international version Bible, there should be a note at the bottom of the page. If so, it reads like this. After the word Israel, Masoretic text. Dead Sea Scrolls, see also Septuagint, reads the sons of God. What's going on here? Israel. Israel comes in the very next verse. Well, something happened historically, either to change the Hebrew Bible or the interpretation of it. Let's see if we can figure this out. Verse 9 reads, this is going to help us. Someone allowed? The Lord's portion is his people. Jacob has a lot of inheritance. The Lord decided that he was going to keep one of the ethnic communities for himself. And he did that by calling <coughs> Abraham and Abraham's descendants. So we see there are two inheritances involved here, two geographies, one belonging to uh, all the nations, many belonging to the nations, and one particular inheritance, and that is the descendants of Abraham. Now, what is this Masoretic text? Uh, but a very quick overview of the history of, of our Bible. First, well, the Bible contains many pagan texts borrowed from the Near Eastern context in which the Hebrews were living, much of it Egyptian, a lot of it uh, Mesopotamian. Then there was the oral history of the people of Israel. It's passed down generation after generation till the time of Moses. And of course, all of this being guided, superintended by the Holy Spirit, resulting in texts written in ancient Hebrew language. We continue in history. The Bible that Moses and other prophets produced has come down to the present day through three lineages. One of these came out of Egypt. There have been a huge Jewish communities in Egypt. And there are to this day. But one of the biggest cities was Alexandria. Why would an Egyptian city be called Alexandria? Alexander the Great conquered. Conquered Egypt. And the Egyptians made him pharaoh. Under the, what we might call the Pax Greca, of the Jewish community was able to grow and establish itself in that city. And so that became primarily a Jewish, Greek-speaking city. And so the Greek uh, translations of the Old Testament, with, or the Hebrew Bible, came out of Egypt. And the oldest, best preserved manuscripts come from Egypt where they preserved in the dry sands. Is that where they got the papyrus to? Much of the papyri, yeah. And secondly, there was always a community of Jews in what we call Israel or Palestine, the Holy Land. Holy Land is going to have a new meaning for you before we get out of here. And that was where the Hebrew text was being recopied and preserved. First in a form we call proto Masoretic text, and older versions of the Hebrew Bible. The third lineage was in Babylon. From the time of the captivity, the Jewish people adopted Aramaic as their primary language, <clears throat> began writing Hebrew and Aramaic characters, translating the, their Bible into Aramaic, along with commentaries that we call Targums, which are fascinating uh, views of the old Bible. The Greek version was preserved in what's called the Septuagint and other translations, which eventually were retranslated into Latin and revised by Jerome in the 5th century AD CE. Masoretes were those who were copying the Hebrew Bible by hand for centuries with very tight controls to keep it accurate. However, we're going to learn they did occasionally decide to make some modifications. And we, these become very apparent when we look at what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are older copies of the Hebrew Bible. The complete Hebrew Bibles that we have date from the 10th century CE AD. And there's very little Hebrew manuscripts from times earlier. There are a few scraps, however, 
than you found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So what happens is this. The Jewish community up in Egypt was preserving its Bible largely in Greek. But they did translate the Greek from Hebrew, but an earlier version of the Hebrew Bible than what our Bibles today are translated from. It's still 99.9% .9 the same, but it's that one-tenth of a percent that is most fascinating. There are manuscripts that have been found from about the first century BC that have one version of Deuteronomy 32a, which reads, that is, sons of God, or sons of the gods. Uh, our best preserved manuscripts are from the 4th century CE, or e, which uh, was modified from sons of God to read the angels of God. Sons of God, that sounds too polytheistic. Let's soften it and call it angels of God, before the text eventually was modified to read according to the sons of Israel. Here's Qumran Cave, number four, uh, inside the cave. Of course, now emptied of everything that was in it. But one of the fragments of a manuscript that was found in Cave 4, designated 4Q37, means Qumran Cave number 4, <laughs> fragment number 37. Which, and this is all that's left of it. But that's all you need. Because here's what we have. At the first piece of lineup, we have three letters partially preserved, which tells us what the word was. Binu, the command to consider. You look at verse 7, and there it is. Then the second line, allotted. Bechunachal means exactly what we have there. When God allotted to the peoples their inheritance. And then at the very end of that verse, we have on the third line, reads, B'nai Elohim, not B'nai Israel. The oldest says, oh, sons of God or angels of God. So the hypothesis that scholars generally follow today is that Jewish theologians wanted to dissociate the name of Yahweh from that of the pagan gods. His name appears in the same verse or the same sentence with pagan references. They decided, let's protect the name of God and alter it, but we will remember what we did. Unfortunately, we didn't. I look at that small piece of, of scripture, or right. piece of paper, yeah. and I see you know, hear some history, stories where the Piltdown Man, the uh, many, many uh, evolution was built from a, right. a, a small finger bone or right. something like that, and they built a whole man right. out of it. So I look at that and I go, okay. did we build a whole lot of theology or spiritual things out of a small scrap of paper? You could, yeah, you could. Uh, one of the problems was Piltdown Pilt Man never existed. In this case, the scriptures existed. And this fragment was amongst many other bigger fragments which were biblical. Okay. okay. So we say it looks like we have another piece of biblical manuscript. Same material, same script, same style, same ink, same radiocarbon dating. And we say, okay, we've got here an authentic piece of scripture and it happens to be a verse that has been troublesome, difficult to interpret for centuries. Within another generation of evangelicals, if we last that long, our Bibles will adopt that as the primary translation, and the old Israel word will go down into the footnote. Yeah, but I think it's I think it's interesting. So the ESV uses uh, sons of God. Yes. And the Berean Study Bible uses sons of God. Right. But the NAS, even the NAS 2020, uses sons of Israel. It does. So there's a even even the the, the translations that claim to be the truest right. to right. Um, the original manuscripts right. will vary. Exactly. But there is a trans transition. Right. There is. Yes, thank you for pointing it out. Plan B was frustrated, so we come to plan C. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So God is now going to start a new work. Chooses a man, a pagan man, living in the dispersion out amongst the inheritance under other gods. Abraham was reared as a moon worshiper, apparently. But Yahweh chooses him, appears to him, gives him something to do. Abraham's future is going to be dependent upon his obedience, was to trust that Yahweh will keep his promise. But did God appear to Abraham in a human form, in a life, real life form? 
It's the voice in his head. Totally the context, he had a dream. And in the dream, God appeared as a fire, which he will do again for Moses later. <laughs> so if you're connecting the dots through the Bible, those fire is one of those themes. But here were the promises that were made. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you. That is, I will speak kindly about you. I will make your name great. Greatest name in the world today. The so-called three of Abrahamic faiths, one of which is phony. I will make you a blessing. You and your descendants are be of great benefit to others. I will benefit those who benefit you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And by the way, all of the people groups, all of the ethnic communities in the world, on earth, they are going to receive my benefit through you. What did Abraham have to do to make all of this come to pass? Believe. He had to believe and then? Shall obey. Obey. Right, so he, obedience expresses faith. Our thesis is that God wanted the nations to find him. Meanwhile, he is calling to himself a special nation. Why can we say this? Well, we have, for example, Paul's sermon to the Athenians. He made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him. Now, had he not done this, could they still have sought him? Well, if he'd left them in that city with that tower and communi communing with uh, the gods, they might not have sought him. So the purpose of scattering the nations was partly in order that they would seek him. However, they would have to seek him because he would not be directly revealing himself to them as he was doing through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants. At the same time, Yahweh forbade Israel to worship the created gods, the ones whom Yahweh himself had created, whom he had put in charge of the other communities. When you look up to the sky and see all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. Right. Now it first sounds like, well, that you're just talking about the asters, uh, the stars and the moon and the sun. Well, that's included. Those are created things. But he goes on to explain here that he's also talking about things or beings apportioned to all the nations. Whatever is in the heavens that I have put in charge of the other nations, you Israelites, you are not to worship them. Don't listen to them, don't obey them, do not bow before them. And this reason for which, down through the centuries, Israelites to this day, if they have any faith at all, uh, are known for their refusal to adopt foreign faiths. A tentative definition of cosmic geography. Wherever Yahweh dwells amongst humans, there alone is holy ground. So we're going to talk about sacred territory, sacred geography, as places or human communities where Yahweh is worshipped and where he rules. That was the system for a while, but eventually we learned that the legitimate gods have messed up. One of the re reasons for which it is so difficult to deal with the ruling spirits over a, over a community or a territory is that they have a legitimate purpose for being there. God put them in charge of us, but they're not doing a very good job. Let's go back to Psalm 82. God presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? The gods who are in charge of the nations they seem to give more deference or preference or empowerment to the unjust and to the wicked. This is one of the reasons why we as Christians are supposed to hold prayer meetings and to pray often and for a variety of needs when we come together in our assemblies. However, evangelicals tend not to do that very much. The gods know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. The problem with the gods, they've never learned. They don't seem to know or understand how God really works 
or the true God, Yahweh, what he really wants for humanity. And so they end up working against him. So the foundations of the earth are shaken. If you're a dot connector, you go through scripture and you find all the mentions of Yahweh shaking the earth. You come up with, it's a biblical theme. And one of the reasons is that he's removing the foundations from under the gods, to speak metaphorically. The result is this. Now remember, the, the divine council were not created to die. And in Adam, they will not die because we're not descended from Adam. So God decides he's going to have to take some radical action with the ruling spirits. I, the most high God, say that you are all gods yeah. and also my own children. But you will die just like everyone else, and including powerful rulers. And so he's speaking to the, the, the divine council members in charge of the nations and telling them, you're going to lose your immortality you're going to die. In other words, you're going to be cast into the underworld and you'll never get out of there. Some of you for a brief period during the book of Revelation, but that won't last long. The ruling spirits, they know what their end is. And so the spirits ruling the nations today are trying to delay the inevitable. When Jesus uh, found a demoniac and engaged the, the spirit in a conversation, the spirit asked him, the time hasn't come. Are you going to punish us before the time has come? And the Lord said, no, no, I'm not going to punish you now. But get out of the man, and you can take up residence in that herd of pigs over there, which I have told my people never to eat from anyway. But then what did the pigs do? They ran down the hill into the lake, and they were drowned. So those poor little spirits didn't even stay in the pigs very long. The psalm concludes with a prayer. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. What? What? Wait, wait, wait. Doesn't that deny what scripture said earlier? I give an inheritance to the nations, but Israel will be my inheritance. But now the psalm says, oh, Lord, if you are going to disempower the ruling spirits, then what are you going to do? Oh. Maybe you're going to take the inheritance back. And all the nations will be come back to you. However, the problem gets worse. The Israelites have also messed up. Not only the God. Well, what did they do? How did they mess up? They worshipped the gods that surrounded the nations. Oh. Yeah. They made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. They sacrifice to false gods, which are not God. False doesn't mean they don't exist. False means they're not the truth. They're not the God. What else did they do? They went off and worshipped other gods and bowed down to them. Gods they did not know. Gods he had not given to them. In fact, some suggest that perhaps that over through its history, the majority of Israelites eventually went off into idolatry, that is, the worship of these other deities, many of which claim that it is they who provide the rain and the fecundity for your fields and your herds. So what is Yahweh going to do about this? The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is on all their armies. He will totally destroy them. All the starry host will fall. Okay. Notice we have double reference here. He's not only angry with the nations for their unbelief, disobedience, criminality, and infanticide, uh, and his wrath upon their armies, which wreak havoc with populations. He's going to destroy them, but also the starry host. In scripture and in, in other ancient literatures, this is another phrase for the angelic beings, or the gods that rule from invisibly. In that day, that is the coming day of the Lord, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. Double judgment is coming. So this is why our uh, apocalyptic <coughs> literature puts so much emphasis upon the wrath of God that's coming upon the wicked nations, but mainly upon the spirits who rule over them. The gods rule over nations and territories. So in Daniel, we have reference to the prince of the Persian kingdom, 
Remember, Daniel's written in Aramaic, so it uses a somewhat different vocabulary. But prince still means ruling power, at least over a, a certain territory. So this is not the king of Persia, this is the prince who, who rules spiritually over Persia. And is that prince still about to this day? He's making a comeback. He's first going to try to take out Saudi Arabia, and then is going to feel free to take out Israel. There's also reference to the prince of Greece. Something different happened, though, amongst the Greeks. They became Christians and effectively put the prince of Greece to into retirement. Then, remember the story of David. When he was being pursued by King Saul, at one point he and his men had to flee into Philistine territory. And while he was amongst the Philistines, David lamented, they have driven me today from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, go, serve other gods. All right, Lord's inheritance, remember what that was? Israel. Israel is a people, but also understood Israel as a territory. Now, some would say, well, this just reflects the old Mid Middle Eastern view that every god had its own territory, and Yahweh was the local god for the Israelite. But David doesn't believe that. He believes that Yahweh is God over everything, but he also understood that when you left Israeli territory, you went under the jurisdiction of other ruling spirits. And even though you are faithful to Yahweh, and you do not, and you remain loyal to him, you're still serving other gods. By the fact that you're there, by the fact that you're paying taxes to that foreign government, by the fact that you are actually using your troops to help keep the peace in that foreign territory, and doing that, you're serving a different God. Wouldn't a modern day parallel that be if when you leave the United States, you are no longer protected by the Constitution of the United States? Wouldn't that be a very similar application? Anyway, he understood that he left Yahweh's special territory, though he had not left Yahweh. And then the story of the Syrian military officer who had a skin disease of some kind, their little servant girl whom he had captured during a raid to Israel, reminded his wife that there was a prophet in Israel who could cure such diseases. And with some prodding and goading, he went to Israel, eventually followed Elisha's directives, washed himself seven times in the Jordan River, which he thought was disgusting because there were cleaner rivers in Syria. But when he came out healed, he concluded that the true God is Yahweh. It's not Marduk or Baal. It's Yahweh. So he wanted to go home and worship Yahweh. But his feet, he understood something. Syria is not Yahweh's territory yet. So what did he ask for permission to do? Assyria requested, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifice to <coughs> any other god but the Lord. So what's the, what's, what's the dirt for? To be so sacred take, ground. You take it home, <laughs> spread it out on the ground, step on that dirt, and worship Yahweh. Yeah, it was sacred ground, holy, yeah, holy grounds for churches that love coffee. Was his theology absolutely spot on? Mm, not by today's understanding, but at the time it made sense. And it seems like a faithful. <coughs> Thank you. New Testament cosmic geography. I'm going to suggest that New Testament recognizes that Yahweh, who is not called Yahweh in the New Testament, He's called the Lord. In the New Testament, he's called the Lord. Reason for which most of our Old Testaments translate Yahweh as the Lord. And is in it all capitals? In the Old Testament, yes. In the New Testament, no. And just English conventions. Both Greek and Hebrew at the time were, had no case system. Everything was capital letters. So under Yahweh, we have this concept of profane space where the other gods rule, the lesser gods, and sacred space now is where God, Yahweh, rules, whether a community or a territory. Now, under profane space, however, 
since I've lived and worked in countries like this, everybody recognizes that there are what uh, there are clean sites, clean space, and there is unclean space or dirty sites. Reason for which you have to know when to take off your shoes and when to keep them on. So I walked into one place I thought was a clean place run by Christians. So at the door I slipped off my shoes and stepped in. And the lady came running across the room. Oh, sir, sir, please put on your shoes. This is not a clean place. And so I put my shoes back on. And then there was a time I was visiting some old decrepit ruins. I started to walk in with my shoes on and a guard came running up saying, sir, take off your shoes. <laughs> this is a clean place. It was an old shrine to the gods. But even for us now as Christians, living in sacred space, we have both our church life and our social life, and we are to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, both in our community and outside that community. But how can they tell which is clean and which is dirty? They just know from childhood or from the kind of place it is. Our struggle is against the rulers, against the authorities, yeah. against powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Exactly. So those powers are still there. They still have a lot of influence. Where Christians prevail, they have no real power, so they use primarily deceit. Ultimate liars, reason for which I refuse ever to listen to demons. They will always lie to us. And even in the case of a sinning Christian who is living like a pagan, in immorality in the church, Paul's advice was, put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this, hand him over to Satan. How do you do that? Putting him out of the fellowship puts him back into Satan's territory. One of the things we learned then is that at the current time, for us New Testament believers, this room right now is sacred space. Jesus said, where even two or three of you gather, what? I'm in your midst. Yes. That makes the space sacred. Ten historical sacred spaces. First, there was the mountain in the garden in Eden, where the Lord was dwelling with uh, the first humans, along with his divine council members. Secondly, after several mess-ups, Abraham and the Israelites became God's special community, his inheritance, and the land that he gave them. Thirdly, in their midst, there was the tabernacle, which allowed Yahweh to come dwell in the very space on the geographical location of the Israelite encampment. However, he confined himself to a tent where sacrifices had to be made to purify the way of access to him. The primary reason of the sacrifices in the Hebrew Bible are to keep the way to Yahweh clean because the way we live in fact everything that comes out of our body defiles the space then there was eventually the temple at the center of the nation still requiring sacrifices but eventually when jesus came he came right into the temple remember the temple by that time had been vacated yahweh had not left several centuries earlier but with the arrival of jesus he's back enters into the temple calls his apostles around them, and eventually he's going to take them up onto Mount Hermon, which was the idolatrous center for the ancient Near East. And to this day, there are hundreds of shrines on that mountain. And when Jesus was standing up on that mountain, he said to his apostles, on this rock, I will build my church. I am going to start my new international community right here, right now, giving a poke in the eye to the gods, and he was transfigured amongst them. The church at Jerusalem and in Judea, they become the new center of Yahweh's rule. They are sacred ground, followed by the, every church established amongst the Gentiles, reason for which every time a Gentile comes into the church, Ephesians says that is the wisdom of God being explained to the spiritual powers in the heavens that their time is drawing near. We're told that our very bodies, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, are sacred ground. 
reason for which any time you are tempted, you can say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. Messiah Jesus, reigning over the nations, is yet to come. And then eventually, when Eden will be restored, in the new heavens and the new earth, and all creation once again becomes the Lord's inheritance.